thanks a lot. Thanks for the introduction. Um, it probably reveals that I am kind of doing too many things at the same time, like many scientists. But I'm going to talk a little, blend, blend together some of the work we are doing. And the focus for us has been dynamic climate and dynamic, what's that? When someone was asking me a while ago. That's actually what happens outside. While we in a greenhouse usually try to keep normal steady conditions on a climate chamber, it's kind of like this. So I'll just prove the truth. And then it's kind of this, the background of my work was originally in greenhouses. I know these modern greenhouses, that the <laughs> cucumbers to the right is actually from Finland in the middle of the winter, where they produce plants like that. So we are talking, we'll talk about some of the dynamic issues when we normally do phenotyping. Uh, then combinations of what happens if you have several stresses or several conditions at the same time. And then some challenges what's happening. Because if you look at modern greenhouse production, this is from Netherlands, it looks very modern. You have, at least in, on the continent, uh, there's automatic systems for measuring plants, growing plants, lo logging it. And if you look at a phenotyping system, this is from Aberystwyth in Wales. Um, this is one of the commercial phenotyping systems where you can measure the plant growth, the water control, control the water, and so follow what happens with the plant life when you do different stresses. Phenotyping is a really upcoming topic, or has been an upcoming topic. And originally it was kind of done to separate different plant species in terms of responses. Of course, the favorite animal or the favorite pet would be Arabidopsis. But within the last few years, um, this is a study made by the EPP and European Plant Phenotyping Network, showing that suddenly agronomists, breeders, biologists has realized it's a very nice tool to find varieties or species which might cope with the future. So wheat and maize uh, has come up as top 10 field crops, and people are focusing more and more on, on agronomic trades and water status. So the phenotyping moved from the Arabidopsis, sometimes when I'm even say artificial world, to the real life of the fields. And of course, the greenhouse is a nice component between because you can control most of the factors. So talking about um, dim the, the climates, so even though we try to control the climate in the greenhouse perfectly, there's a lot of fluctuations. Um, Today it's kind of nice and sunny here. I presume a few days back it was gray and wet. That's what I would have expected from our Irish climate. I'm positive. And in the climate <coughs> chamber, when we do the experiments, we usually keep a very, very stable climate. When you look at the uh, climate chambers here in UCD, it's perfect state of art. But I'm, I bet you don't try to play with the, the controls. You try to have a very constant con conditions. And one of the things I like to <coughs> end up saying, well, does it matter when we work with these dynamic conditions and can we use this stuff in the real world? This is some data from the real world. When we started doing a lot of work on climate control in greenhouses to save money, we showed the growers some of these figures. So on a dull day, normal winter light condition, Denmark, the photosynthesis, we have leaf temperature, we have the temperature which just vanished here, and you have the gas exchange, and the real, there's no really top level. If you have high light levels, well, there might be a top level around 20 -ish degrees. But when we add the CO2, and as you can see, this is ancient data because the CO2 reference is 350. Today is 403, last time I measured. Um, and if we then add triple the CO2 concentration, suddenly we see the same pattern as over here. But with the high CO2 concentration, you get a benefit of more growth but you also get an optimum at a higher level. So if it's a sunny day, you don't know to need to heat so much because you can, uh, the temperature will heat, the sun will heat the greenhouse. And if you then add CO2, you get a lot of benefits. So winter times, don't heat. Summer times or intermediate times, increase the temperature because you have the free sun, but add CO2, add CO2, add CO2. So that's where we started. And if growers use this stuff, commercial greenhouse growers, they can save, say, 30, 40% of energy, the energy costs. They claim themselves, and that has been used in practice for many years. But actually, this is kind of Salesforce Ross, uh, old plant, uh, plant physiology. We have a suppression of photorespiration. 
So this is physiology in the practical sense that since you have this dynamic, you're going to just as well use it in a greenhouse setting. But the light is fluctuating too. So this is just a trace from an infrared gas analyzer on a plant on the rose, which comes when you turn on the light, it goes up to full speed within eight, six, eight minutes or 10, 20 minutes at most. This is hibiscus, another common ornamental. It's a bit more sluggish and might take you one hour before it goes up to full speed. Normally I say this is kind of the A person. In Danish we say people who wake up early in the morning are A persons. The other ones is more a teenager waking up later on. But it has some meaning for the grower because you don't switch on and off light too much when you do hibiscus. While the rose might be okay because the normal uh, high pressure lamp will be on at full speed in 16, 12, 16 minutes. So the knowledge about the species, the reaction time is actually pretty critical also for the dynamic climate. When I talked about climate chambers, this is just a set, simple setup in a, one of our climate chambers where I had made the light go up on and off, or going on uh, in a very dynamic way. So creating a, some kind of a very nice standard day compared to the flat level, but the same DLI, so the day, same daily light integral. And you can see it's, the gas is changed, uh, it's the blue one in dynamic, the stormal conductance. Often what you see also in plants in real life that the stormal conductance is declining a little during the day, some kind of a midday depression. Normally what you experience after having lunch you will get a midday preparation. But if you look at the static ones, well, the, 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 for instance, it seems to be going on a little more during the day, reaching not the same level as up here at all. Well, and you see the stormy conductance going a little down. So just tracking the gas exchange on a static versus dynamic uh, light com combination means there's differences. And that's a challenge when you're doing uh, phenotyping in the field or in a greenhouse. Like in Wales, they have two greenhouses, which means you have two climates. Um, that's a challenge to work into. But also the small term dynamics. This is some figures made by one of my now former staff, um, where she tried to track the leaf, the relative growth rate of a chrysanthemum um, with different day length. So the, the gray out is the night, and the white, of course, is the day. And you see that there's a lot of fluctuations um, during the day in the, in the leaf growth or the relative growth rate. And it doesn't, seems to be, it seems to be not really strongly affected, but there's a pulse uh, in the morning, well, in the late afternoon. So as soon when, when you have light going off, there's a response in the plant's expansion. So it just shows that during the day, these plants are extremely dynamic and can cope with these different conditions. Why did we do this? Well, we were interested in using a dynamic control of light. So having turning on the light when the energy was cheap. And we were just wondering, will this work? It worked quite nicely. But if we're coming back to the gaseous change, <clears throat> this is the same pattern, but showing gaseous change for photosynthesis on top, storm and conductance on top and gaseous change below. And you see the gaseous change for synthesis is really responding like that to the change of light. Storm and conductance is a bit sluggish, teenagers, um, during the day and going down to, of course, closing during the day. So there's, we were worried what happened totally when we have these fluctuations, regular or irregular fluctuations. We turn on and off light very irregularly. But the plant is not, at least the chrysanthemum, is not able in the vegetative stage to detect day and night. It doesn't care. It just seems to adapt very quickly. So kind of a rough summary that the dynamic light, if you get the same DLI, it doesn't affect the plant function. Good. Then we could play with more, even more dynamic conditions in greenhouse. But I'm also using this to tell my colleagues in phenotyping, the hard fork phenotyping environment, that you actually need to monitor more what's happening. Because like in whales, not to put whales in the spot, but when they do the phenotyping, they, 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 they need to have, well, at least 20, 20 hours to do the phenotyping to get all the plants to the chambers to measure. That means that plants are measured at different times of the day, which means they are measured on different environments. 
different preconditioning. And that's a challenge because what happens if you measure here or here in terms of growth, uh, leaf uh, expansion rate, water uptake? They don't like me when I say that. So what we did, we tried also to work with this uh, 3D scanner. Uh, so it's a laser scanner where you can measure the projection. You measure literally the projection of the leaf area, not the actual leaf area, and the size of the plant. But that means you have to run a laser um, over the bench. And we're wondering what happens if you have a laser running over the plant, does it will affect the plant? And we linked it to uh, fluorescence, chlorophyll fluorescence measurements, these aluminum sticks, not expensive aluminum sticks, measure the fluorescence, chlorophyll fluorescence continuously. And then we just made a comparison of light intensity with the plant eye, which is called the 3D scanner is called. So we didn't have to worry. There's no effect on the chlorophyll fluorescence if we run over a laser scanner and we run it every 10 minutes. But that allows us to measure continuously, well, every 10 minutes during a day, the leaf growth, leaf expansion, the height of the plants. If you put on a camera on a, most of these plants, you will actually see the plants are trying to fly because the leaves are doing like that. And that's a challenge to calculate because when you then try to get a trace of the land eye, the growth rate of different, 10 different cultivars of uh, rapes, rapeseed here, um, there is a huge difference in the growth rate measured by the uh, plant eye. So this is kind of the estimated fresh, fresh weight, the estimated dry weight, and the estimated leaf area. So we can separate different plants or different lines, and you can actually separate them at a very early stage. Normally, but well, there's only one solution to this measure, measure. So here you can do it invasively. And the end, we did it invasively too, because we wanted to, to have a good reference. So fortunately, there was a very close correlation between the plant eye measurements and the physical killing or fresh weight, dry weight, leaf area of the plant. So that's a neat toy which you can use to measure the plant growth in a dynamic environment without touching it. But now we, I've been talking about control environments, greenhouses. But I will just show you a, a case where we tried to move it from the artificial environment to the real life. So this was an experiment we did with a guy from a breeding company in Nepal. He wanted to be a PhD student. So we invited him up and we did some measurements. We, we collected a number of varieties from the breeding company, which were commercial varieties in, in Nepal or India, northern India. And then we wanted to screen them uh, using the chlorophyll fluorescence techniques called the FVFM, which is the rough and dirty. You put on leaf clip, measure after 25, 30 minutes, and you get an impression of the efficiency of the PS2. So we wanted to look into heat stress and also do it to the first flower, because we know that in many varieties, if you apply heat stress on the flowers, you normally see a disruption of the, the pollen or you see no fertilization going on. But then we, in the end we decide, okay, let's try it out in Nepal. So run the risk of doing it. So this is a typical example of when we do heat stress on, on tomatoes. You see some of them comes out very nicely. Uh, some of them comes out not like not very round pollens. So the pollen variability is really variable depending on the variety and the heat stress. But we, what we did in a simple way, which we've been doing before in wheat, was trying to make a very rough and dirty screening. So we put the plants, we pre-acclimatized uh, the plants in the climate chamber, gave them some days of strong heat, 40 degrees, 28 degrees, uh, and a moderate light level. Uh, we didn't want, we could have put more light on it, but if you do that, you have a risk of introducing photo inhibition. So we just measure the chlorophyll fluorescence. Next step, we pick, pick the best guys in the, uh, the sky, the tolerant or the intolerant varieties. And then went into meet more details, measuring more stuff. You can't do that on 28 varieties. In wheat, we started 1,240. That was a killer. So now we're down, down to 40. Um, but the same type, a slightly moderate heat stress, and then in the end, we did a field trial in Nepal where we took the best ones and the worst ones. So trying to separate varieties. So 
So if you look at this figure on top, we have to the right, uh, you have all the varieties that we tested on the, in the first screening. And that makes a maze of data. So the other one to the left, your left, um, is showing kind of the separation of the most tolerant one and most sensitive one. So it gives us a very neat separation uh, of the values when we heat stress them. This is after five days of heat stress. The lower figure is then the, the second screening we also, where we also let the plant recover to a normal uh, climate conditions. And you see there's a really nice physical uh, separation of VFM. The plants who were tolerant um, had uh, recovered very quickly and was back to normal literally. And if we look at some of the plant uh, parameters, like the upper one is the dry weight, the total dry weight. The one to the right are the tolerant ones, the ones to the left are the non-tolerant. And there you see the control, of course, is the best. The other ones are not so far away. So in terms of both leaf area and dry weight, we have a good separation based on this screening technique. We also did the heat stress uh, and pollen uh, heat injury index. So the pollen vi viability is much higher in the torrent ones, not surprising because what, that's what we wanted to. And in terms of the heat injury index, uh, kind of a technical in index of how much, uh, how much damage you see. It is a measurement that you can do. It's a measurement that breeders often do in terms of heat tolerance. So it's a quite well-known technology. Then we went to the field. Unfortunately, I didn't went to the field. He went back. And then we re repeated the experiments or the four genotypes in a field. And the tolerant one looked, looked like this. The intolerant one looked like this. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends on what you see it, that was the year of the earthquake in, in uh, Nepal. So the temperature in the field was up to 40 degrees. And we thought we had stressed them a lot with just with 40, 28, but the average temperature was actually not so far from there. And if you look at the kind of fruit set, the torrent ones had a very nice fruit set. Uh, the heat injury index, in, injury index was the same, torrent, in, uh, the torrent, intorrent, and the dry weight was quite good uh, in terms of the torrent species or varieties. So here we actually did a rough and dirty sorry, expression, simple technology. We screened them in our control and condition. We measured the gas exchange, and we could see that the gas exchange was not so limited by the heat because the stomates did not close fully. In the, torrent, the intolerant ones, the stomates closed more or less fully, uh, leading to, image, to more or less Im uh, immediate senescence. So we can't explain why the pollen is viable because we didn't go into detail. This was a three months project, but a kind of unusual way of trying to get uh, the data doing it in the field afterwards. But we have a feeling that we have a steady carbon uh, uptake, carbon accumulation in the plants, which means that the flowers have a chance of surviving. And the pollen viability is the same issue. If you have a more robust plant with more carbon carbon store, there might be a better chance of maintaining the same. But it's kind of the biggest the, the take home message from that experiment was, OK, we can screen cultivars which are regarded as good quality cultivars in, in the field in Nepal. We can find varieties which show, show a higher temperature tolerance using the chlorophyll, for instance. And actually, we can seem to be able to link what happens in the highly artificial climate chambers to the real life in the field. So going back to the indoor environment, humidity <coughs> is also a big issue if you grow plants in a greenhouse. Um, it's not stable, you have a huge fluctuations, and in many cases it's a major challenge because uh, if you have too high humidity, you, well, normally I would have expected high humidity in Ireland, you have to heat to get rid of humidity, and many plants doesn't really cope well with high humidity um, because you have disease issues, you have post-harvest qualities. So this work was done by one of my PhD students and we looked into roses because roses are notoriously a poor quality, potted roses have notoriously a 
relatively poor quality. If you forgot to water them, they're dead. And it shows up that there's huge differences in the, the varieties. So here's the number of cultivars. Some of them are out of the business now because we did this. And he looked into relative water content after four hours. And you see plants growing under high humidity or low humidity. Some of the plants growing under the high humidity didn't close the stomates. They really lost a major part of the dry weight within four hours, meaning the stomates were wide open. So they couldn't downregulate the stomates. So generally, too high humidity means that the stomates get less responsive. And that's not so convenient if you want to ship a plant like that to where, where we ship plants in Europe. Because even before, after it passes the border to Germany, it would be dry now. So he went into depth, in depth, looked into relative water content in details, the tolerant, intolerant varieties, transpiration. You see the plants growing under high transpiration um, is, or high humidity have a much higher transpiration and it continues until they literally die very quickly. And we also continued in, okay, it must be ABA f functions. Uh, but that's an, a really big challenge because when we dried out the plant normally, leave the, we couldn't see, we, we had expected that ABA production from the roots or ABA signaling from the roots would close the stomates. It worked, but root drying takes a while. It's nothing that you do in, a, in a two or three days. But here we saw that uh, if we had the, the varieties with less affected stomates, so having less transpiration, they had very little, they had high level of APA, but the plants which were sensitive to the humidity, they had very little foliar APA. So the plants actually, the varieties differed in the amount of APA. So the foliar APA was apparently some kind of linked to the cultivar was lower, meaning that the plant had no response, they had lost the, the ability to, resp to respond to high hum uh, or changing humidity conditions. When the grower saw these results, he went home immediately. He, we had a midterm seminar with the student and he went home and said, okay, I'll start making a, a copy of this and try to screen my variety. So PhD students can actually work very closely, or work with the industry, understand what's going on. Don't worry if you want to be a PhD student. But we, don't, we couldn't find any links. It's simply the ABA. We did look into precursors of ABA. We couldn't find any really good uh, reasons for why this happens. But it also happens, or we discussed it once, we, we looked in our garden, that sometimes if after a period of very high humidity conditions, some plants uh, actually get spots in the corner and the edges of the leaf because they can't cope with the new uh, humidity conditions. And you see the same in nurseries when you put in plants, fresh plants from in vitro culture or small plants in this large greenhouse, you see a dry out effect because in vitro culture, a young plants are usually kept at extreme high humidity conditions. You don't want to have challenges, but if they can't cope with it, you have a challenge. So it's linked to the light, of course, but we see that it doesn't really matter in terms of transpiration. We always have a higher transpiration periods um, in some of the plants, but they can uh, link it, they can adjust themselves uh, to the different conditions. But as soon as you lower the humidity, the, some of the plants, so some of the cultivars can't cope with it. And of course, we looked, tried to look into the general matters of reactions, and we couldn't really find in these varieties, different humidities, there's no obvious link between temperature and leaf, uh, the delta temperature and the transpiration in light. So it's a mess when you ha have this dynamic condition having a lot of fluctuations in temperature and light. So we can actually, phenotyping for humidity is a kind of a different way of looking into it. But when I'm showing this to some of my colleagues uh, working on phenotyping, they kind of, okay, what happened in our control in our climate chambers or in our greenhouses? Do we need to think about more looking at the humidity and such? So trying to conclude here, it depends on, on the stomal enclosure that is linked to the foliar APA. And apparently there are some huge differences in the genetics in that case. Uh, 
<coughs> and the girls love this because they can save money in terms of heating. So right now we are doing some modeling, trying to predict how long time you need to have the, you can tolerate to have the high humidity because there's no reason for reacting just like that if the plant uh, is able to react in one or two days. But of course, if you have a disease coming in because of the high humidity, you should react. So moving from phenotyping, uh, one of the challenges is also we are doing a lot of models. When you look at the climate change, there are tons of models out there and yeah, even regional models. One of my colleagues in Aarhus University was just doing an integration of 11 models to make one model and then you get lost because we have climate models who say thing, something about climate change, the elevated CO2, elevated temperature or change in temperature. The only thing that goes up all the time is CO2. And as Trump says, it's good for us. <laughs> he says so much. Uh, but we know also that drought and heat episodes is coming up and we have tons of crop models of different species and very, most of them are kind of linked to the yield of course, because farmers are interested in that. So what we wanted to do in a EU project uh, was trying to combine some of the models with the physiology. And that gave us a, quite a challenge because we have crop modelers and we have crop modelers. And some of the crop modelers, the guys from France, Inra, Montpellier, they talk about leaf growth, uh, plant, the models are based on plant growth. And the modelers from Wageningen, in the Netherlands, are modelers working on physiology. So for the synthesis reactions, I understand what they are talking about. And it's not the accent that, that is the challenge. It's really different ways of thinking in terms of models. And you can just imagine having us trying to coordinate a project with different model dialects, different language dialects, and trying to find out what to do. But we did this project called Model Stock about Carbon Stress, where we tried to work with both temperature, water supply, and elevated CO2 on wheat and oilseed rape. And done in Wales, in Jülich, Germany, in Copenhagen University, in Wageningen, in, in Montpellier. So small internet project, but a lot of work. And the, basically what we were interested in, between what happens in terms of the gas exchange for, for the synthesis when we run different species, sorry, different cultivars on different conditions. So we picked two uh, wheat varieties and we grew them under, in a climate chamber under a normal condition, kind of 1840 or slightly elevated uh, 2824, same BPD daylight. And then we swapped them because many of the changes you see in climate is sudden changes in temperatures, heat spells, heat waves, literally. And on top of that, we had a drought treatment. Uh, the thing you see below is a drought spotter where we can grow the plants and irrigate them, so keep them at a, either constant humidity, uh, soil humidity, or let them dr drop down or increase that, uh, increase it, whatever you want to feel. It saves five students per week to do that, but it costs money too. And then we had a CO2 treatment. So we treat, tried in, this, in the same experiment, look into CO2, elevated CO2, change in temperature, drought, and that's not fun. And if you look at the, what the plants, uh, the cultivars look like, not surprising we saw that if we had no CO2, uh, some of the varieties of the cladius, it turns a little bit yellow already here, even though we fertilized it. But we gave the plant the same fertilizer. It wasn't a fertilized experiment. But as soon as you have high elevated CO2, you have faster growth and you will see a depletion of nitrogen. So that's a challenge when you run experiments. Do you want to look at, at the treatments or the indirect effects? My colleagues in Copenhagen uh, had a st strong drought experiment and the, one of the elevated CO2 plants literally died because of lack of nutrients. So that's a ch one of the fun things of doing combined multiple experiments. If we look at the gas exchange, this is a gas exchange at different temperatures. Um, it's clear that the control was the mid in the middle, the, the high, the one with, with elevated CO2 had the highest gas exchange, not surprising. But if we look at the combined stresses, so this is a single stresses here, over here we have the combined stresses. It seems as if as soon as we have water, 
lacking. It kind of eradicates any advantages of the elevated temperature or the elevated CO2. So water stress is sometimes the controlling factor, the limited water is the controlling factor for many of these global change models. And that's not always taken into account, I can say that. When we look at, uh, this is just the, temp the optimum temperature from dif the different treatments. Uh, as soon as we had um, all the factors coming in, we had a higher leaf temperature because the water stress means that the stomates are closing a little and then you increase the temperature. So that's a quite a logic uh, explanation of what's going on. I should actually be looking at this one too, but that's not here. Um, so we looked in all the parameters and right now uh, showing the stomach conductance at different temperatures. Um, and we can see that we couldn't find any real obvious links between the heat stress or the different combinations and, and the, the responses. My postdoc is struggling to write the paper right now and she's kind of getting more and more desperate because we can't explain it. And it would be like, nice to have a, some kind of mechanical explanation of what's going on in the plant reactions. So typically we've been, what we are seeing that as soon as we have, just to make a resume, the water stress can actually eliminate any other positive effects of the plant reactions. And it's seen both in the stomach conductance and in the, in the photosynthesis. We didn't do chlorophyll fluorescence in that experiment. We didn't have time. So we did also ACI curves, and we can see there are some differences. But again, look at the standard deviation bars. It's nothing that you'll write home to your mother about. This is really good. The best reaction is actually the, the control. And that's not surprising, because we selected the 18, 14 degrees as a kind of normal reference for the, for, for the growing of wheat. So the plants are probably adapted to those conditions. But drought, again, we see what we expected. The elevated CO2 gives you in promotion of growth. You see the more efficient, uh, the J-max is higher. But we can't really detect which one is uh, the best in this case. But it's what you expect that the elevated CO2 might uh, alleviate some of the negative effects of the elevated temperature, so you get some benefits, but the water stress is pretty disastrous. A disaster, the water stress is what you would expect in many cases uh, with global change issues, that the, the, the amount of water, the evaporation will be, the evapotranspiration will be higher, so the plant will be exposed to more water stress. This year is not typical. Denmark has, one third of Denmark had had the rain the yearly rain already now, and it's kind of soaking wet. So it's a challenge to talk to students saying, we have a global change, we have less water in Denmark, we have higher temperatures after the summer with no summer, well, one summer day uh, and rain most of the summer. But when I talk to my colleagues in South Africa, their water reservoirs in, South, in Cape Town is down to 20% of the normal. So some parts of the world is a challenge. So for this, one of the things I would like to say in general is we need to think about more multi-factors when we run experiments, even though it results in even more gray hairs. There's much, much black left. But when we run different stresses, it doesn't seem to that your normal arithmetic is working because it doesn't make sense that we, we can show each of the individual stresses has very clear effects. But when we combine them, it seems that the drought stress can overrule any other stress. And it's not linked to genetics necessarily. necessarily. It can be, but uh, in wheat, uh, we've not been able to, to link the, the, what I showed in tomatoes, the FEFM, to flowering, because if we try to run that heat stress on the, the heat tolerant wheat, the flowers, the plants go into immediate senescence. So it's also a matter of what kind of species you're working on and how much uh, stress you are applying to them. But I would just throw one thing in as a more, even more dynamic issues. This is tree basils. Um, you see they look slightly different. Any idea what I did with them? 
as a hint below. Okay, now I should be finished, I can feel that. The one to the left, to your right, to my, your left, had a pure blue. The one in the middle had a pure red, and the one to the right had a pure, a, quite a broad band white, very much like uh, solar uh, LEDs. And I've, if I ask people to taste them, this one has a distinct flavor of turpentine or kerosene, not, not really attractive. This one is very bland in the taste. This one has a normal basal type. But if you look at the measurement of chlorophyll content of flavonoids, you see there are huge differences between the varieties. So this is the plant coming from grown in monochromatic light or broadband light, and you can actually create huge differences in the taste and the flavor. So it's a kind of also just a message to people working in greenhouses that or climate chambers, you have to think about what kind of light I'm using to create the effect that I want to get. Because the plants, the dry weight is slightly lower in the, in the red ones. I'm doing, my colleagues in Sweden are doing some more in-depth analysis of secondary metabolites right now. This is just a rough and dirty in instrument. But the fun was to show this to people and let them taste and okay, we have a difference, but what happens in photosynthesis? What happens to chlorophyll fluorescence? Next question. So I think horticulture is actually pretty important in terms of uh, this uh, interaction with in phenotyping because the greenhouse horticulture has a long tradition of being controlled, knowing what's going on, knowing the timing of production, knowing the temperature, knowing the light level, being aware of what happens in terms of humidity. And well, we already have very high tech solutions and we already, already use some kind of stress management to, to see what to control, like getting a speci specific flavor in, in the spices. So there's a lot of solutions which we are using in horticulture which can be used for phenotyping. And that's probably why I'm part of some of the phenotyping environments because I'm talking about how to measure light, how to measure temperature, and understanding what happens there. So there's a lot of project going on in this, um, I call them the sponsors, not very polite, but we're involved in two regional EU projects and some large uh, EU project on phenotyping. And we've just started a new food center. So if any of you are interested in collaborating in terms of food and plants, you're welcome. But that's kind of the conclusion today. Thanks for your question. Um, that's it.